All right, all right, all right. How's everybody doing? Uh, welcome to this week's Griscom stream. Uh, thanks everyone for being patient. I'm trying to new one again today because I thought I'd make reading the chat a little bit easier to do live, but it seems like there's a little bit of a delay. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, welcome uh, to this week's stream. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about American socialism, sort of looking a bit at that tradition, um, but mainly um, working off of one really early document that I think, I don't know, it's an interesting place to start, and maybe this can be an ongoing uh, series for us to do here, um, because I, I do think it's really important, especially for us younger folks, um, to remember that like the history of, of socialism is not only um, very, very long globally, uh, but it has deep roots in the United States as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll begin into all that in just a moment. Um, along with a couple of stories, um, but let's get right into it because we got some questions already from folks, um, and maybe some good places to start um, up on. Um, Nameless says, could you respond to some of the petty critiques of Bernie? People act like his compromises are the same as Biden's or that he isn't far enough left. Um, I mean, Bernie's uh, the kind of politician that Bernie is. Um, and the kind of politics that he sort of represents and is what made him viable for so long um, aren't really, you know, going to be ones that are going to be, I don't know. It was a big mistake, I still think, um, that we haven't had some kind of a political, um, at least pre-formation party led by Bernie or, or that Bernie was sort of directing people to uh, post-2016, post-2020. I think that's a real mistake. Um but again, this is the the kind of realization of just who Bernie is as a politician, because um, as much as we, um, you know, uh, I mean, like Panitch makes a, would make this point a lot about Bernie, where he thinks that, you know, Bernie, for example, running the Democratic Party is a mistake um, or at least would have advised beforehand not doing it. Um, but then you see what ended up happening uh, with Bernie running in the Democratic Party in 16 and, and 20 um, and the openings that it created um, along with the pitfalls. So I don't know. Um, maybe I'm being too fair here with what we mean by the kind of petty left critiques, but like from there, I think there's like, there's some room um, for us to sort of be able to, I don't know, reckon with the reality of, of those two sides of, of what Bernie represented and the strengths and the weaknesses of the kind of Bernie style uh, movement. The strength certainly was that it brought a hell of a lot of people into left politics, socialist politics that weren't there before, along with the fact um, that he had an extremely clear message. Um, that I think was able to resonate with a lot of folks at the same time, you know, there are the difficulties where I think some people were probably more confused about socialism uh, than, than, than they may have been before. Right. Because uh, it was never really, you weren't really pointed anywhere past like the Bernie campaign, for example, or Medicare for all. I think a lot of people have a hard time sort of envisioning, um, you know, what a socialist future would look like because it's so much like mediated through those kind of programs. But I think you're probably, I mean, I don't know if you're talking about what Bernie's been doing over the past few months during the Biden administration. I mean, he's trying to make sure that those bills are um, providing as much as possible um, for people inadequate as they are. Um, I think that that's a useful and a worthwhile way to spend your time if you are a United States senator. Um, so I'm, uh, if I knew any more off the top of my head, I could respond to more. But um, um, MDR says, is re-education enough to reverse the effects of the risk scare, counter-propaganda, or will it just happen again organically? I, mean, I think we're in a good uh, position right now where we're able to sort of push back um, through, uh, I don't know, like a lot of the, the kind of fear around the word socialism, I think is a lot less, um, than it was even six years ago. So I think, I don't know if you need re-education as much as just sort of like showing up. I mean, for a long time, socialism and, and communism and Marxism have been able to be defined by our opponents. Um, and there's still people who are trying to make that the case. That's Lin James Lindsay and all of them. But, uh, you know, you could push through that pretty, uh, easily by being able to define things under your own terms. Um, all right, well, let's see if I can catch up. I think I can now maybe show these. Um, Dunk Chino says, what do you think of Felix's suggestion of Eric Adams and Pritzker's running in 24? I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's see. Is Bernie Rant planning on a 24 run? I couldn't imagine um, that he is. Um Thanks so much, uh, Christopher, for the chat. 
I think it'd be sort of, I don't know. I mean, who knows what happens? <laughs> I think, though, we have to start thinking politics a little bit differently than being so fixated necessarily on presidential runs. Um, I think that that's also one thing that, um, I mean, I, I see this all the time on the show. So I know people who watch this show many, many times, you know, watch these streams, you know, weekly, prior tired of hearing me say it. But, you know, Bernie was like a Hail Mary shot at, at state power. Even if he comes into power, what did Bernie say? we would need to have mass mobilization of people on the streets to be able to implement um, the fairly moderate proposals that he was running on, right? And that's the correct analysis, right? That is what you would need. Uh, you don't just have to look at the United States, but look at countries like Syriza, places where you have seen left-wing parties come into power and then they are unable to sort of implement a lot of the things that they want to. Um, you have to have that that secondary force, absolutely. Um, and and the so the point is that not that Bernie was wrong in his analysis, um, but that no infrastructure like that existed um, in sixteen, and certainly not in twenty twenty. Um, and I bring this up not to discourage us from sort of wanting to shoot um, for the heights of of, of power, um, but also reminding people that like okay, so now we're not in this kind of emergency moment where we're sort of having to coalesce a, around like a Bernie Sanders per se. Let's start to do that work of being able to build those those movements um, that can show up. And again, these don't have, a lot of work goes into these, but they don't have to take decades and decades and generations. I mean, people always get worked up that I'm saying you have to wait forever to do things. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but you also have to understand what kind of forces you need if you want to if you want to change things. Um, we have another one. Let me see. I'm, I think these are showing up. Um, uh, Dungachino says, and I appreciate the chat too, says, uh, do you think Mel and Sean has a chance next March? So I think I'd really like to do um, some have a guest on to talk a little bit more in depth um, about France. I mean, Melanchon is a sort of eccentric uh, candidate. Um, um, I think you know what it's really frightening. What's really frightening is it's looking like there might is is much more likely um, that there is a far right um, candidate coming in. Uh, it, it, you know, if not Le Pen again in the second round election, uh, the the other guy, the journalist, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, I mean, France has really taken a an extreme far right turn, and it just goes to show you um, how sort of coalescing around centrist candidates, neoliberal candidates like Macron, and like you know, people forget already about the you know the yellow vest movement and all the pushback that the Macron government has has gotten for just being extremely austerity driven, extremely neoliberal and extremely anti-worker. Um, it, it just goes to show that, you know, some kind of like centrist defense, you know, everybody coming together to support centrism or, you know, neoliberalism to like ward off the far right fascist threat um, doesn't really work because fascism and, and the far right movement of France seem to be even stronger today um, than they were when Macron was elected in the first place. So anyways, I would love to have somebody uh, break that down more in depth because uh, I'm, I'm not as keyed into the French um seen as i am other parts of the the world um i mean again i don't think that people falling so i don't understand this this comment here about paul street um never fell for bernie stick um i don't think that bernie had a stick i think that bernie has probably been one of the most influential and and uh um, powerful and important left politicians in the U u.s scene for a long time uh, I mean, he really reinvigorated a movement. And I think there's some people who like to sit on the outside um, and sort of, you know, act just because we didn't sort of win at all, um, that it wasn't worth doing. I think that that is a very defeatist kind of mentality. Um, let's see. Uh, Duncan, Chino, this, here we go. This is good. Uh, you know, socialists and communists should hone in on the next Chicago mayoral election. That could be a great attempt to set up a, a physical power base. I mean, Chicago um, is is one of the more exciting cities in the country right now for building socialists and left power. I think that, you know, building these kind of power bases is going to be absolutely critical. Um, hmm. All right, let's see. Let's get Professor Wolf back on the show. Yeah, Professor Wolf is actually very, very uh, tuned into French politics. That would be great. Um, I, I missed uh, talking to us for down about a year. Um, French plus, is, plus Texas solidarity. Hell yeah. Need my David's opinion on deep dish pizza. Yay or nay? I mean, it's good. It's not pizza proper. 
Um, but I will say, you know, it was invented by a Texan, so a little bit of hometown pride, I have to say, even in uh, Chicago. Former Longhorn, uh, Texas Longhorn, actually. So a bunch of Texans moved up to um, um, Chicago. Um, let's see. Pennsylvania, too. Yeah, keep supporting Paul Prescott. Um, we interviewed him last week, if you didn't see. Um, didn't see. Yeah, awesome. Um, and we got a... Hey, David, Professor Wolf knows a lot about French politics. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to have uh, Wolf on again. Um, we're, we're keying in on our uh, 50th episode about four away, so maybe we can get him back in there for there um, as well. Let's see. Um, should we keep doing questions or should we get to this this American socialism, this kind of history? Because uh, I think uh, I, I found some documents I think are actually really interesting. And for this week's uh, patron episode, Matt and I are going to be doing some Lenin uh, readings for folks. Um, and one of them in particular is actually very keyed into the actual tradition history of American uh, socialism, I think is worthwhile. So why don't we, why don't we do a little bit of this and then we can come back to questions. All right. Um, I, I want to read um, some text. Let me pull it up so we can uh, keep up with it. But I want to talk a little bit about the very, very early American socialist movement. Uh, I'm talking still um 1890s, 1898 in particular, um, and the founding of the American Social Democratic Party. And before we get, this is one of those moments, this is one of those things I think is really important, and I'm just pulling this up. Um, this is one of those things I think is really critical um, about sort of really immersing yourself in these histories and these traditions and not sort of getting everything secondhand because you can make really glaring mistakes. And this is a small thing, but it's something I notice a lot. You know, people get really worked up about the term social democracy, right? And obviously there's a lot of history that's sort of packed into that term uh, when you say it in 2021. Primarily, um, people are sort of using it to... Um, distinguish between you know the more moderate um left wing of, of the german um spd versus the, the radical communist movement right lenin as well um moves from the social democratic party to the communist party but when you read a lot of um early texts and especially things like from 1898 when people were describing themselves as social social democrats or social democracy etc um you know do not go into it thinking that this is sort of time. I don't know. Is it, when people hear social democracy, they think that that means necessarily political ideology, but for the vast majority, uh, especially of early socialist and communist history, that was just the popular term uh, that people were using um, to describe, um, to describe the kind of political movement. And I see a lot of people, I, I just bring this up because sometimes Matt and I will talk about, um, you know, maybe even something from Lenin um, in, in the history of like social democracy. And then some would be like, well, I hate social Democrats. It's like, I don't know. Do get a little bit more in depth in these things than just sort of context clues uh, is all that I can say. Um, l let's see. Um, yeah, there we go, Strom. Anyways, I mean, the point is that they used the Lenin and, and other movements started using the term communist and, and socialist later to distinguish from a more moderate ring of, of social democracy, right? So like understanding in that context is perfectly fine. Um, but I think that sometimes it creates confusion for people who don't sort of understand that that was sort of a, a tactical and kind of rhetorical decision by some folks to make that that kind of split versus if you read, um, you know, older texts of like, for example, Lenin or, you know, lots of, of different figures, and they might be using the term social democracy in a different way um, than what you're used to. Um, but anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about the early American Social Democratic um, Party, uh, which was sort of the precursor to the Socialist Party um, that you know very well. And of course, Debs is highly involved in this. Um, but I just want to bring this up for a couple of reasons. One, to sort of make this argument about American socialism and, and reminding folks that this is a very rich tradition. Um, it's a tradition filled with contradictions, uh, with tensions, with victories, and with spectacular defeats. Um, but it is no less rooted in America um, as any other kind of American political tradition. I mean, this is, if you're an American listening to this, this is our history as well. And, you know, not to uphold it in some kind of like jingoistic fashion, um, but to understand that like the fight here is very deep rooted and we're not the first people to sort of try to find a way out 
of the kind of political wilderness that the American working class has found itself in for a very long time, right? Um, and, and sort of learn the lessons, understand the victories, be able to celebrate the the heroes, and also learning the the kind of the mistakes and, and the struggles and all the things that, that people went through. I just think it's really crucial, actually, um, to not sort of separate yourself um, from from history because socialism and, and, and Marxism are very much historically rooted uh, movements. Um, and they're fascinating too, because these are, uh, um, you know, these are, uh, you know, a lot of the places where this sort of, you know, was where the socialist movement and the social democratic movement were strongest were places like the Midwest and for a time, the South. Right. Um, and, and, and certainly the West and obviously major cities like New York. Um, but I don't know, understanding that this kind of history has been denied to you by your, your, uh, the American education system um, to make socialism seem like it's always been a foreign import. And that's always been one of the, the major moves um, that right wing uh, opponents of socialism uses to try to make it seem like it's something that's been imported from, you know, Germany or later Russia. Um, or there has very deep roots in the United States. Um, and, and later this week for patrons uh, this weekend, Matt and I are going to be reading a, a really great text by Lenin that I highly suggest people read uh, called Letters to the American Working Men, um, where Lenin himself was writing um, letters and, and, and praising Debs. And it's just an interesting kind of realization that America was not absent um, from this kind of political scene. Um, and all right, I wanted to just sort of, but I wanted to move through um, this founding document um, let me pull it up for y'all right quick. And you can find, you know, and for people who are unfamiliar, you know, you can find almost any, uh, all of these different, uh, texts for free on, um, on Marxist.org. It's an incredible resource. It's a resource I use all the time. Um, and this is the declaration of principles of the social democratic party, um, which was adopted at Chicago, June 11th, 1898. And we'll come back to the actual text of this document in just a second, because I just I, I think that not only is it interesting and a lot of times when we talk about the Socialist Party or Debs or things like this, it's just a sort of like, well, look, there, there are people that we can claim or like people were socialists in this country before. Right. And again, I think that's important. I just was talking about how important I think that is. But I actually wanted to bring up this text in particular um, because of one, the context of how it came about and to two, look at the actual program because they have um, what is it, a 12 point. Uh, program that I think is extremely applicable today. And I think sort of, you know, it's 2021 now. I mean, this is, you know, over 120 years old. Um, reading this and one, imagining what this would have looked like, one, if it had been implemented, but two, seeing how similar these kind of uh, demands are um, to ones that socialists make, and maybe to note some of the areas that we might agree with on policy um, that but might not be the front of the movement. And I would make an argument that many of these kind of things should start leading our movement and our, our demands um, as we sort of move past like a post, I don't know, presidential um, uh, movement in general. Um, but essentially, to give you the quick and dirty history of how this document was founded, um, you know, after mass labor unrest, right, which Debs was a member of, which a lot of like early socialists were a, a member of this mass movement in the 1880s and the early 1890s of serious strikes across the country. Um, more and more militants, people who were fighting for the working class, start to realize that to push back against the power of capitalism, you can't just fight it solely as a, as a group of, you know, I don't know, disparate workers, right? Um, and even building larger trade unions in and of itself was not enough, but that you needed to start to take the fight into politics as well, right? So having two different um, forms of, of struggle, it's a point we make a lot um, in, in, uh, in relation to some of the, the writings of Gindin and, and Panish as well, right? To think about the union as class organization at the shop level, at the factory level, at the industry level, but to think of the political party as the class organization in society. And this is a lesson that is learned not just in the American context, but in the Russian context, in the German context, in the UK context around this time, that it's not enough to just sort of organize um, in labor unions in and of themselves, right? The point, obviously the point is like you want to be organizing unions and expanding their membership across the board, but you also need to have a political arm of the fight. And this is a, a realization that is basically um, learned in the, you know, the heat of, of serious struggle um, in an extremely bloody time when the 
the state and corporations were just, um, you know, wantonly attacking folks in, in the street. I mean, they, I mean, you know, serious massacres, um, you know, just, just brutal crackdowns on, on labor organizing, right? So the realization is that you have to be able to fight on all of these different fronts and that eventually what needs to be leading um, these fights is a kind of merging of of the working class into you know the political arm and then the the, um, the like the industry arm and you do that through the political party so you get all of these different groups together you know including different groups of anarchists um you know mem certainly lots of members of the trade union movement um the socialist La labor party which is like the the earliest uh, socialist party um um and, you know, they, they basically went with this aim of creating a socialist party, right, a working class party in the United States of America. And the hope was, is that they had this huge delegation to create, um, you know, the, the, the party for social democracy, social democratic party. Um, and basically, like to just to, to make this this uh, this quick, this precursor quick, you get all these different socialists and anarchists together and there is almost immediately a schism. And this is something that um, I, I think is worthwhile to note. Um, not necessarily because these ideas are exactly the same, uh, the tactics, and we'll get into what the difference in tactics were. Um, but the point is, we're going to talk about the difference in tactics between the anarchists and the socialists in just a moment. Um, but it is interesting to see how, well, obviously what we're calling for is not necessarily the same kind of tactics today. Um, I don't know. Where people sort of put their emphasis on on action and, and, and movement, I think, is is very telling about which one of these movements is viable. And look, I have a lot of friends who are anarchists, but I think that this um, is something that you can at least look at the historical record and see what comes out of it and which one wins out. But basically, there's two different sides of this of idea of building the political party for the working class, the Socialist Party, the Social Democratic Party. Um, and there's two different sides. Uh, one is a side of colonization, right? And the idea was that you get workers um, to maybe go out and buy, you know, um, a mine or something uh, out west where land was still very cheap um, to go buy something like that and to run it under like socialist ideals, right? To run it in a way um, where you didn't have a capitalist at the top of it. People were sort of sharing um, in the proceeds, um, you know, owning their labor, essentially. Um, you get rid of like hierarchical systems of, of management of people, right? To basically go and live the, the socialist idea while capitalism is still the dominant uh, mode of production, basically having these different kind of enclaves around the country. Um, and it's an interesting idea, and it's something that is not unique to this moment. Uh, people continually um, have tried basically to create these kind of little pockets of resistance. It's an idea that's as old as Marx. It's an idea that Marx very much rejected, uh, basically uh, by saying that, you know, they're very happy with you to go off in the woods and to do your own thing, um, as long as you're not touching the major modes and, and, and forms of, of production in society. And, uh, you know, basically, like, you know, you're basically taking the most militant members out of society, out of the struggle. Um, and, you know, they're pretty happy with that to see you guys like maybe even, you know, oh, maybe you potentially start up one thing that works out. It was just not to necessarily, um, you know, attack the idea, you know, whole cloth, but as like the kind of focus of a political uh, movement, um, you can sort of see what, where it might have been wrongheaded. Um and then you saw the other wing of, of the founders of the Social Democratic Party, um, people like Debs, who are more interested in politics, literally in, in the movement to take state power through winning elections, recognizing um, that the state is controlled by the ruling class um, and a way to wrestle the power away from the ruling class is by showing up, mobilizing the majority of people in the society, workers, um, in, into coming into power, right? And this creates uh, this schism between people who want to sort of, you know, pursue colonization instead of doing politics, right? But, you know, basically to create these, you know, worker owned industries um, versus people who wanted to sort of fight in the actually existing um, systems that were happening in the United States, win state power along with organizing, um, you know, workers. Um, this creates a, a huge schism and out of this schism, and this might be, um, and this might be, uh, um, we might, might, I think it'd be really interesting to maybe do a whole history of Social Democratic Party, 
Socialist Party and then early American Communist Party. Uh, that's not what we're going to do today because I want to just get to this text because I think it's really interesting. Um, but out of this really um, out of this schism, basically between a kind of colonization anarchist movement versus the politics movement, a small splinter of of this group goes off and they form what becomes the Social Democratic Party. So again, the Social Democratic Party and this text that we're about to read comes out of a schism, comes out of the left cutting itself in half as it does time and time again. Um, the thing that makes this interesting is that this didn't end up just being a tiny sect. Uh, while the Social Democratic Party only lasted a few years, um, a few years later, it basically merged with the Socialist uh, Party. And many of the members uh, who wrote this text, um, who deliberated on this text, ended up becoming leaders of the Socialist Party. Um, so let's get here. I want to show, uh, I want to share with you all um, this this text because i think that uh um it's it's just a very interesting text and then maybe i'll come back and get people's thoughts all right this is the declaration excuse me i have to pull it up again um i'll pull it up so y'all can see i don't know if i can make it larger can y'all still hear me if i do that let me know if if you can't um but this is the Declaration of Principles. Here we go. Let's see if I can make this a little larger for you. Here we go. Okay. This is the Declaration of Principles of the Social Democratic Party adopted at Chicago, June 11, 1898. And I won't read the entire text here, but they have the preamble, which is, I think, very strong. Um, Social Democratic Party of America declares that life, liberty and happiness for every man, woman and child are conditioned upon equal political and economic rights. That private ownership of the means of production and distribution of wealth has caused society to split into two distinct classes um, of, of capitalists or exploiters. With, sorry, with conflicting interests, the small possessing class of capitalists or exploiters of the labor force of others, the ever increasing large dispossessed of wage workers who are deprived of the socially due share of their product. That capitalism, the private ownership of the means of production is responsible for the insecurity of subsistence, the poverty, misery and degradation of the ever growing majority of our people. I just wanted to note, um, even just right there, I mean, th that is a... Um, a pretty large, um, you know, and a very different way of, of talking about capitalism than you even see from people um, who who are, you know, kind of prominent socialists today. I mean, this really is is coming out, you know, very, very strong. And I don't know. I don't want to get so attached to having to use certain kind of terminology. Um, but I do think that sometimes um, we move so far away from this kind of property distinction, from the kind of who owns the stuff, who owns other people, the proceeds of other people's labor, um, that we sort of make the mistake of dropping the kind of weight of our analysis, because we're talking about nothing less um, than, than, than firing and destroying the centers of power that capitals have over our lives. Um, and you see people start to make those rhetorical flurries from time to time. Um, but I don't know if it's as foundational as it should be. Um, but again, people should read this entire document. But I wanted to go um, and just go to the program here because I just think that this is a very interesting um, set of demands. Um, so this is the program here. Um, as steps in this direction, we make the following demands. So this is quite radical for the time. Um, one, revision of our antiquated federal constitution in order to remove the obstacles to full and complete control of government by all the people, irrespective of sex, right? So very early call for women's suffrage um, as the number one demand. Two, the public ownership of all industries controlled by monopolies, trusts, and combines. Right. That's that's number two. Right. I, I just like this is leading the, the demands. This is leading the movement here. Um, the public ownership of all railroads, telegraph, telephone, all means of transportation, communication, waterworks, gas um, and electric plants and all other public utilities. Um, four, the public ownership of all gold, silver, copper, lead, coal, iron and other mines, also of all oil and gas wells. I, I we're going to come back to that in just one second. But um, can you. Imagine 
<laughs> Can you imagine for a second um, what society would look like had the working people, the toilers of this society, been the people who reaped the benefits of, um, you know, of of oil, gas and coal in the United States? Right. If that was actually going into bettering working people's lives instead of creating some of the wealthiest people in human history. I mean, it's just quite radical. And I, I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to focus on this text, um, not only because it's sort of interesting, it's an interesting kind of historical document, um, but it's just like, look how radical this history is, right? Look how radical this tradition in, of American socialism is and compare that to today, right? Like we have like a challenge to meet. Um, if we want to stand in this tradition, um, that this tradition is extremely radical, extremely forward looking. Uh, and, and I just think that sometimes people think that, you know, everything sort of, I don't know, progresses in this kind of nice line. Right. And like just the radicals and socialists on the left today are like the most radical that they've ever been. I don't know. You read these kind of texts. Um, and, you know, I feel like a little inspired to, you know, to sort of up it um, and to talk very seriously um, about what we can be using the world around us, the labor around us to do to benefit our lives, the lives of our communities, the life of our families, right? And to getting that monkey off of our back, what is the private ownership of the vast majority of resources in this country, the private ownership of your labor by your boss, right? Um, I, you know, this is this is our, our tradition. Um, and, and, and we should never forget that. Um, but let's go down because there's a few more. Um, reduction of the hours of labor in proportion to the increasing facilities of production. Again, extremely farsighted, um, something that you see from time to time um, in like liberal publications today is things like, oh, wow, you know, why did we not see reduction in, in the working hour, despite the fact that workers are much more productive with machines? Well, that's because it's a power relation, not just a technological relation. Um, and you have to address that, that, uh, that power relation. And that's exactly what you're seeing um, in this, uh, this argument right here, um, is that, you know, we don't have to, like, you know, so much of what we see after this is this kind of, I don't know, pining this kind of conservative pining um for the days of old uh because you start to see people's labor being um replaced uh by you know machines um but what could easily have happened was that we would have had to work less um and and enjoyed more time to ourselves and enjoyed larger fruits you know of our uh, uh, enjoyed the fruits of our labor at like a higher proportion right being able to pull in more money to be able to do more things to have more leisure time um instead what we see is just a massive increase of production and the benefit of that goes to the bosses so again this is just a very far-sighted document um six uh, the inauguration of a system of public works and improvements for the employment of a large number of the unemployed, the public credit to be utilized for that purpose, all useful inventions to be free to all, the inventor to be remunerated by the public. I mean, Jesus Christ, that's an uh, amazing one right there, right? Um, you know, when people talk about um, <laughs> will, will there be a, uh, um, a motivation to innovate under socialism versus capitalism. Um, this is a great example of alternative models um, that not only benefit the inventor as an individual, uh, but benefit the whole of society. Um, you know, this is such a, an incredible, and this is like a part of the, the, you know, the, the art of science, right. Um, is, is discovering and creating for the benefit of, of humanity. It's capitalism that perverts that kind of relationship between society and human innovation. It's capitalism that takes things um, that should be some things that belong to the public with praise and, and you know, money and remuneration um, given to the, the, you know, the inventors, the people who, who create these things. Absolutely. Um, but it's capitalism that takes these things and puts them in a box and, you know, only sells them out to the highest bidder. Um, we're seeing the, you know, that's a huge loss to humanity and also has a huge toll as we're seeing right now um, with the United States, despite all the things that they're saying, essentially hoarding the, the capabilities, um, you know, that, that we have to produce a medicine um, for, for people in need. 
Um, eight, labor legislation to be made national instead of local and international where possible. Absolutely. You don't want to have pockets. And this is something that ends up happening across the, the country, right? Is you have large parts of the country that have weaker labor laws. You see companies sort of, you know, voting with their feet um, and leaving areas where people are sort of able to get local um, protection for workers. Um, and it pits the working class against itself region by region. Uh, nine, national insurance of working people against accidents and lack of employment and old age. Absolutely. I mean, this is radical. You see this obviously in some form um, under FDR. Uh, 10, equal civil and political rights for women against the and the abolition, abolition of all laws discriminating against women. Extremely radical too. Um, you know, for the time, very simple demand, but crucial one. Um, 11, the adoption of the initiative um, and referendum and the right of recall of representatives by the voters. I've always thought that we need more democracy here, uh, not less. 12, abolition of war as far as the United States are concerned and introduction of international arbitration instead. Anti-imperialist um, as the age of imperialism was um, you know, taking off. The demands for farmers are no less radical. Because um, I want to hear what y'all, I want to read what y'all have been saying in the chat. Um, I, I think this is great, though. Uh, and I think also another legacy that we can sort of include. I mean, uh, we, we've done some episodes on the show with Kowalski sort of talking about what is needed in, in more rural parts of America, and especially in agriculture. Um, and I think having that kind of dual understanding of, of what's needed is, is cr critical. Um, certainly, this comes out of the tradition, though, of you know the Farmers Alliance merging with the Knights of Labor. But um, number one, uh, no more public land to be sold, but to be utilized by the United States or the state directly for the public interest or at least to farmers in small parcels of not over 640 acres. The state to restrict regulations as to improvement and cultivation force um, force and water waste to be put under direct control of the nation. Two, construction of grain elevators, magazines and cold storage buildings. You know, this is just like, a, you know, a modernization of the system. Uh, three, the postal railroad telegraph and telephone service to be so united that every post and railroad station shall be also a telegraph and telephone center. Telephone service for farmers as for residents of cities um, to be at cost. A uniform postal rate for the transportation of agricultural products on all railroads. Five, public credits be at the disposal of counties and towns for the improvement of roads, soil, and irrigation and drainage. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, to look at something like that, um, <laughs> it's a, it's, it truly is a, you know, a quite a radical document. And this is, again, you know, a, a tradition that we have here. I mean, there's a lot of, so this is an American tradition, just like uh, many of the others that you learn, right? And sort of learn where to orient yourself and learn on, on uh, what side to stand on. Um, I, I just, I, I find this kind of text to be incredibly inspiring, um, not only, again, because you're sort of uncovering uh, these histories, um, but two, look at that and compare that to the kind of demands that we're making today, right? Certainly there are things that should be modernized and certainly there are things that are left out. Um, but kind of fundamental demands and tying of democracy um, to the eradication of the private ownership of, of resources um, and, and of the means of production, right? Pushing back against a system that turns technology against us, um, turning a, um, our backs on a system that turns human innovation um, against us, turns human innovation, something that should be a social good um, into a private pariah, right? Challenging that kind of um, understanding, I think is something that is extremely farsighted. Um, and I, I think that as we're building movements, having the capabilities to be able to come up with documents like this, be come up with visions like this, um, is, is something that's, that's really critical. As much as we do have to focus on you know what's sort of achievable in the next six months in the next year right um we always have to be able to look five ten fifteen twenty years um in, in into the future right um because that is the kind of radical horizon that we can aspire to and challenge ourselves um to meet um and, you know, that was something that was a, a really great tradition um, in the early American socialist movement of just like unbridled optimism. You know, we look back at that time as, as a kind of very difficult time um, to be around, especially to be a working person. Right. Um, this is a time where, you know, many, many Americans weren't even treated as full citizens. Um, this was a, you know, a part of a, a time where essentially corporations were able to act as private police forces, um, you know. 
um i mean this is a very difficult time but still within it it's just like there's this incredibly incredibly optimistic um air and aspect of so much of 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 these early socials and left-wing um, workers movements and i think that it's worthwhile to be able to go back to that well um even when you start to feel a little sour about you know the conditions that we're under today and realize that like things can be rough um, and, and things certainly are difficult, um, but we have to, I mean, socialism is an inherently optimistic uh, philosophy that out of all of this, um, we can, uh, we can find something, uh, we can build something more uh, beautiful. Um, I want to, I'm going to sort of come back and, and be reading through this. Um, happy to see David's story in here. He says, the thing is we've been convinced that collective ownership of nature is radical, which is a really fucked up, which is really fucked up thought. That seems natural to me. I, I mean, certainly agree. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, is so rich. Um, I mean, it is, it is an unnatural thing. Um, I think that most people can sort of, I think that like most people can sort of understand you learn convention, right? You learn how to sort of talk about things and, and think about things. But absolutely, um, when you see, you know, nature and, and, and wilderness, you know, you do see this as just, I don't know, it's not a space you necessarily have to control, right? But this is a, I don't know, it's a space and like the whole concept of ownership of these things um, is something that we've certainly been taught. Um, but the thing is with, especially with like the European tradition, it's been hundreds of years of sort of building up that kind of conception. And the hope is, um, that, that we can build something uh, different where, I don't know, where we're not trying to like own things to exploit them. Um, let me see. Um, no, the IP guy, I had to ask him to stop. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep up uh, with the chat. I'm, I'm scrolling down now. Um, Kowalski says uh, many rural infrastructure investments were made during the new deal era. It only took 40 years to get, I mean, yeah. And you know, I, we have friends and I don't always agree with this analysis, but you know, Dustin Guastella has an interesting point that like a lot, many of these kind of early demands do become met later. Um, I think the unfortunate thing, and I think that it's something that we shouldn't be sort, sort of, I don't know. Um, that yeah so we get some of these things especially when it comes to you know a national insurance for the elderly and, and people when they're not unable to work um you know but it shouldn't have come at the cost that like the essential gutting of of the labor movement and the radical movement um okay i'm gonna come back because there's some stuff on france but i want to make sure um i'm not missing So somebody says, optimism, yes, complacency, no. The American socialist movement of the past was fighting the Gilded Age. We are fighting a growing fascism and another Gilded Age and climate change all at once. Undoubtedly, but it's not as if uh, the early 1900s were not a, a time when you weren't seeing um, mass mobilizations of like white supremacy and a homegrown American fascist movement alongside um, some of the, the, the height of American imperialism. I mean, you know, let's not forget um, that this is preceding, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, who everyone like, tr likes to remember as kind of like swashbuckling cowboy, um, but was somebody who was extremely detrimental to people all across the globe, right? Um, you know, I don't mean that. Obviously, um, we're in, in difficult times, but, um, and I don't think it's worthwhile to sit around and say like what time's harder or better, right? Um, but, I don't know. There's a, there was <laughs> certainly a lot um, going on then, and, and a lot of those forces were much more entrenched than they are today. Um, oh, sorry, I did. Um, I, uh, Strom, thank you so much for. Um, I did. I'm sorry. I'm sort of keeping up with this system, but um, Strom asked earlier if I have read Michael Goldfield's The Southern Key, um, and I have not, um, but I'm very interested in learning more about it. Um, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt was just a monster. Um, 
And I don't know if I can get this on here, but somebody uh, from the Twitch chat. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, uh, Mav Turtle says that their emphasis on getting the railway railway. That's a word I always struggle with. Um, the railway uh, telephone and postal service together is interesting to compare to um, today's discourse around the digital divide. Absolutely. I mean, Underneath me right now, I mean, this isn't even, uh, we're not even talking about bringing broadband to rural America or bring the telephone system to rural America or bring banking um, to poor and working class America. Just talking about the literal infrastructure of the internet. Um, underneath me right now, I think there are five um, fiber optic cables all owned by different companies, which um, are competing for my business, um, you know, through <laughs> sending me about like a mailer, it seems like every two to three days, uh, right? It's, like, it's an incredible waste um, to sort of build all that redundancy to, uh, you know, to, you know, to just provide kind of meaningless competition um, to, to people in urban areas when what these systems should be is publicly owned sort of eradicate um, any of this need for like lowering um, <clears throat> competing prices against one another um, right to just be able to provide the best possible service um, to communities as they need it um, but instead we just lay more and more lines of uh, you know of, of internet cables um, around you know cities and areas that are already completely covered um, to, to, <laughs> to so that like some different another kind of troll can sit underneath um, you know and, and have you know can sit and try to extract um, you know payments um, from from us right it's completely ridiculous and it's unfortunately it's nothing new um, let's see Um, Sean Moon noted, um, IWW was founded in 1905. I love the IWW preamble. The Socialist Labor Party published a small newspaper all the way up to 2008. Sadly, it is gone. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> it's it truly is. Um, I mean, there's just such an incredible tradition here that I think gets forgotten all the time. Um, Michael wants to know, have you read One World Ready or Not? The Manic Logic of Global Capitalism by William Greeter. It pairs well with Thomas Piketty's Capital. I have not. I'm not familiar with that that bit. Um, Kowalski says, fiber won't be coming to my house um, for at least five years. Yeah, it's just, it's just, we have the capability to do these kind of things and we don't. Um, and so we just continue to reinvest in areas to create market opportunities for assholes. Um, well, also, Kevin, I, I mean, maybe uh, I'm really enjoying all these comments and, and from everybody, but Kevin makes a point of rail, railroads and telephones had a pretty strong, pretty strong unions. They probably wanted to share what they knew was a good thing across the country. Um, certainly, but, you know, I think one thing that was really unique about this time too, um, especially like at the writing of this document is you had far farmer mobilization and farmer organization at a level like never before. Um, so people really not only were able to sort of articulate demands that they wanted, um, but they had the weight behind them uh, to start to make those into political realities, right? And, and kind of early demands over railroad um, accessibility. Um, and also, you know, the, the notes about shipping, um, on, on the railroads is not a small thing um, either. I mean, eventually the government comes in um, and, and, and starts pushing back against all these competing um, interests that were just jacking up the prices for rural people. And, you know, especially people involved in agriculture to be able to ship their goods across the country. Right. Um, it was something that was necessary uh, to make American capitalism work in a way um, was, you know, socialization of, of transportation. Right. I mean, you know, in, you know, in all these Western States, um, you have entire, you know, parts of the government that oversee um, railroad systems. And that's a good thing. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, to your point about um, the, you know, union people wanting to bring the good, the good work that they were putting together for folks. But it also comes from people sort of knowing what they needed. I'm talking about rural people and, and sort of demanding it. Um, here in Australia, the government rolled out NBN to bring fiber optic broadband to the whole country. Telecom companies raised pitchforks and got their way. NBN became shit. Yeah, that's the that's the kind of tension of having a mixed system too. 
Um, let me see. Um, all right, I'm coming down. I like this too. Um, David uh, says our uh, electrical cooperative is actually investing our money in bringing fiber in my area, which is very rural Alabama, where no private companies exist. This is the way it should be. We will own the lines. I love that. And like, that's another thing. I mean, again, like, I don't know. Some, I think y'all know me and what I think well enough to not think that I'm being like jingoistic or overly nationalistic. Um, but you look at places like Bama and, and even Texas, right, where you have these kind of interesting, I don't know, uh, cooperatives that that were able to develop um, and, you know, and they do good work for people. Um, and, and they're sometimes in places that you don't typically expect them. Right. So like not all um, of Texas, for example, has like uh, electric cooperatives. A lot of it is free, um, you know, is free market private um, electricity. But the areas. Um, that do have those cooperatives, they have a really interesting uh, tradition. And oftentimes they've been gutted and sort of people's understanding of what they are. People's understanding, like we own this, this is ours as a community um, has been limited. And you're also seeing, um, for example, uh, the state GOP basically trying to overrule our ability to control things that technically already are ours. Um, but understanding like, I don't know, understanding, um, that we actually do have these kind of interesting, these are not foreign ideas in the U S right. We actually have a history of coming together and collectively owning things that are to our benefit as a community and as a society. Right. And like, I don't understand, like this can go, I mean, electricity is no small matter. Right. Um, you know, and finding these things and sort of building off of them, understanding these things as a part of an American tradition. You know, if you like, I'm just saying, like, if you need to convince people, like, you can sink into this history and lean into this history a lot. I'm um, saying, so, like, this is what we've been doing for 120 years. This kind of like over the top free market neoliberal thing is an invention of 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 the 80s, right? At least it's like a kind of hegemonic, right? The dominant narrative, the dominant understanding of, of things is something that was developed by the right wing. It's not our tradition um, as, as a country. Um, and, you know, once we start talking about collectively owning, you know, these these goods and services that are critical to us, um, I don't know where you start to draw the line because there's a lot of things that we need and would benefit from collective ownership and stewardship. Um Yeah. And we have our, our Brits here to remind us as, as a British guy railroads from the backbone of my country can't live without them. Um, yeah, they're very critical. It's a shame of what's happened to ours here. Um, as soon as uh, Internet access has been a godsend for rural communities in China. <clears throat> and uh I have to say, I'm not up to date on this Australia stuff, so I'm just taking all his words for it. Um, Thuy says, uh, the failure of the liberal-run NBN was an illustration of FDR's point that you can't trust parties who copy promises from progressive parties who have no intention of following through. Um, this is cool. I did not know this. Uh, Jay, Shea, Jay Shea says, uh, pre-World War II, Kansas City built 50 miles of electric interurban light rail within 1.5 years connected urban areas and rural towns a hundred years later laying fiber optic cable should be a breeze i mean hell laying fiber optic cables should be like the you know the first and most basic thing that we're able to do it really is such a, a um i'm trying to keep on this kind of good optimism here but it really is such a example of american decline um, that we're that we're so enabled not i'm not even talking about the politics of the infrastructure bill i'm just talking about like our a ability to capture people's imaginations and to follow through on providing um social infrastructure for us um that, that we've completely lost that capacity as a society is a real example of decline um Let me see. Um, 
That's wild. Are you in? Are you in China? Uh, Sunay uh, Naiman, I, I pay five dollars for gigabyte internet monthly. We own it cooperatively. That's really cool. Where are you at? If you don't mind um, sharing that. Um, <laughs> oh, Denmark, Denmark, cool. Yeah, I mean, this surprised me. Um, MDR says in a private in a previous post game, you mentioned you played guitarist with Pete Townsend of the Who. Um, can you share that story with us? Not today. There's a there's um, I, met, I met Pete Townsend um, in South Carolina and I played music with him um uh a couple of times at a kind of social gathering um for people of a kind of you know hippy dippy different way of of view and kind of spirituality in the world that pete townsend was a part of i i'm not like i could tell that story later i think it just there's the back story for it is like a little long and i don't know how to how to share it how much i want to share um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to do it sometime in the future. Cause it was fun. I mean, Pete Townsend's a nice guy. Um, yeah, I met him in South Carolina uh, multiple times actually, um, at a spiritual center there. Um, all right. <clears throat> Are you a Travis picker, Dave? Uh, I am. I mean, I picked that way. Um, I, my, 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 my like, cause I play uh, banjo as well. Um, so my earliest like guitar playing was like bluegrass stuff. Um, but over the years I've got much more to the blues and like Travis picking. There are many, many, um, people who know much more, um, about me. I, sorry, um, who know, who are much better guitar players than me, but, uh, I do really enjoy it. <laughs> I'd actually like to hear Matt play because he was actually a pretty, um, a pretty strong he's he was really into it it seems um prairie fire is that water or just moonshine in the mason jar you know i'd be dying um <laughs> if it was moonshine that'd be pretty hard oh man um eat vegetables there's a good jacket piece about how liberals in the 60s had a vision to treat the root causes of crime with massive spending on social programs but couldn't raise new funds for it yeah i mean that's a lot of american tradition um, <laughs> the following tradition after this more radical tradition is kind of inability to sort of meet, um, the moment, um, especially because we, we completely tied up and this was a long project of the right end of the capitals class, um, to completely cut off our ability to, um, um, you know, to fund programs that we all sort of want. I mean, I make this point time and time again, um, that, Look, I mean, like, look, I'm a, I'm a Marxist. I want a radical reshifting of, of the society. But like, you know, you have so have to look at the society that you're in. And in the United States, there was this kind of, of tradition of incomplete um, democracy, but, um, you know, in, incomplete democracy for sure. But a kind of understanding that social goods belong to the people. Right. That the fact that we have education um you know, our, we have a public education system that belongs to us, right? That is something that we control and is the providence of our democracy and of our society and of our community. What neoliberalism did, what Reaganism did, and what the complete capitulation of, of liberalism um, to those ideologies did was give people like per, was to take that kind of understanding outside of people's um, heads, right? To take that language out of our mouth. Right. To be able to say um, to, to, to see things that are publicly controlled, that are publicly owned, um, you know, to, to make us see them as kind of transactional relations. Right. I, I mentioned this when we talk about the CRT stuff and, you know, we've done that enough that I don't need to you know go over everything with that. But you watch the videos of people and the language there is like, I'm the boss, you're the worker. I'm the boss. Like we, the public are the bosses and you the you know the school the teachers are the employees right um and i just think that that's such a perversion of what that relationship should be i don't think that there's anything wrong actually with the community wanting 
you know, certain things to be happening in their schools and to be wanting to have those kind of relationships. Obviously, CRT is like a kind of made up um, problem for the right wing to sort of, um, you know, work up, you know, their base and maybe um, pull in, you know, potentially new new folks. Um, but, um, you know, the, the our, our lack of ability to sort of treat public goods as something that, like, I don't know, that like really do belong to us in a way that's much different from just being a boss um, over an employee, right? I just find that kind of framing and understanding to be so unfortunate. Um, yeah, and bluegrass is a great form of, of music to cut your teeth on. I agree. I mean, you learn a lot about just like how to play music theory from it. Uh, Doc Watson, love Doc Watson. Um I love Jerry Reed. Um, I'm I'm not an expert in his playing style. Um, uh, Bluegrass. Uh, what's your review of the Robert Plant and Allison Krauss uh, album from years ago? I mean, it's a great album. Um, it's it's fine. It's funny. It still sits at the top of of the Bluegrass charts and many of the kind of Americana charts uh, years later. So, um, I think it's great. I think it might be nice to see <clears throat> some other people uh, get that top spot. Um, let me see. Um, thank you so much for the chat too. Uh, Eat Vegetables says, no question, just want to shout you out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see. I've noticed uh, out of Southern GOP legislation. Yeah, um, I mean, that's where it, it seems like it is everywhere, but um, Southern GOP legislation, CRT is an excuse to get civil rights history out of the classroom. Nebraska appears to be adopting that message. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's to get a lot of things out of the classroom. I've seen, you know, things like them taking away um, using the term hegemony, which is pretty amazing um, in some states. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. Um LR, please uh, consider having Norman Finkelstein on some time in anticipation of his upcoming book about freedom of speech on the left, a real critique of cancel culture. The man is a boss. He is incredible. Um, I would love to get him on this show. Uh, we definitely want to have him on TMBS as well. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, as, as we're able to expand, we can get some people who can sort of <clears throat> help me, uh, help Matt and I sort of get the booking. Um because it's a lot to sort of get some of these folks, um, but would love, to, love, love to have him on for sure. Um, all right. So again, for people who, uh, you know, joined us, uh, I highly suggest reading the piece um, that we talked about earlier called Declaration of Principles of the Social Democratic Party. Really cool dive into the kind of real American tradition of, of socialism um we've uh i think i'm gonna head out but just wanted to let y'all know uh this weekend matt and i are going to be releasing a conversation on lenin um we're going to work through a couple of his texts including one called letters to the american working men uh, where he sort of lays out um kind of challenge and analysis and praise for example of of people like eugene debs uh, i think it's just really interesting to see that tradition um Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the Caribbean um, and the uh, radical waves that we've been seeing there. I think we're also going to have to talk about this Musk stuff. I really like I, I know you all like it, but I usually try not to do too much of the dunking videos because it attracts some other people who are, I don't know, aren't necessarily the audience that we're trying to cultivate as much. Um, but we're going to do Musk because he's gone for like a triple whammy. He wants he's been talking about uh, the state. Um, he's being investigated by the SEC for essentially, um, you know, firing and isolating a whistleblower who's trying to make sure that those solar panels that they're installing everywhere weren't going to catch on fire. Um, more investigations about those extremely dangerous autopilot um, systems on those cars, um, many of which um, many of the problems could have been could have been avoided from the get go. But Musk insisted on uh, on pushing things um you know, in, in, in a certain way, much, much more. We might talk about Biden and the, the vaccine stuff just because it's so despicable. And, um, you know, they make announcements and the air sort of gets blown up, but the United States is not doing enough 
uh, one domestically, um, but certainly internationally to make sure that people have access uh, to medicine who want it. Um, and next week, I'm really looking forward to this, y'all. Um, next week, uh, we have a special guest, Liza Featherstone, um, who wrote a really cool piece in the New York Times um, about Josh Howley and masculinity. And we're going to be talking about masculinity and the left and sort of answering the challenge that she lays out in that piece that, you know, a lot of times on the left, we sort of have a difficult time trying to, to, to provide any kind of answers um, to people who might be looking um, into the question of like, what is, you know, what is masculinity? How, you know, I mean, like there's a lot of young men out there, um, you know, who are, are looking for guidance. I mean, myself, you know, I didn't have a father growing up. I was looking um, for, for guidance from a lot of different folks. And I think it is actually important for the left to be able to, um, to at least provide some kind of, of, of guidance um, on, on these questions because the right wing is very quick and happy to be there on this stuff. Um, and they make, I mean, guys like Howley and, Jordan Peterson and, and Ben Shapiro, et cetera. I mean, as, as goofy as a, as a crew that might be, um, they're, they're finding, they're tapping into some kind of real feelings that some people are having about being lost, looking for answers. And I don't know. Um, there's a lot to talk about. So we'll have Liza um, Featherstone on next week. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and as always, um, I will see y'all uh, tomorrow uh, with Matt Leck at 7 Central. Uh, take care.